Hi, Shilpa, Mayuram, and Amrita. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be part of the third talk, uh, where we are going to be talking about heritage preservation and local communities. I welcome you all. Um, I'm going to start by giving a little bit outline of how we are beginning this session. I'm going to be introducing my project, Pakistan Chalk Community Center, which was uh, established in around 2016, where Pakistan Chalk has been, um, as a community center, was established for the people to engage with arts and culture. Uh, during COVID, we went digital, and since then, we've been uh, very actively and radically talking about engagement with the city um, in its uh, form where we can develop alliances and network beyond our own cities and beyond our own geographic sensibility. Plus Nine to One Heritage Talks is a, a child of Pakistan Chalk Community Center, which was established this year. Uh, where we plan and intend to have these sessions every six months uh, to talk about heritage and its built in and its relationship to the built environment. We are going to be hosting webinars um, con constantly year round um, and your advice. And since we are now developing into a network, we would like you to be, be part of it as a long term association. The dialogue on heritage is a global conversation which must take into account that local context. In a rapidly changing world, the dialogue around the heritage preservation is shaped by many and relatively new factors. The parameters of what constitutes heritage are expanding and take into account not just the past and tangible heritage sites, but our present and as well as our current relationship and the spaces we inhabit as communities. At Pakistan Chalk Community Center, we aim to engage in a comprehensive dialogue on the above questions by bringing together architects, researchers, urban planners, policymakers, designers, artists, journalists, filmmakers, bloggers, and activists to brainstorm ideas for the protection, dialogue, conservation, rehabilitation, and accessibility of heritage sites and public spaces. Plus Nine to One Heritage Talks hopes to bring all the stakeholders together under one multidisciplinary setting so that together they may present solutions feasible for concerned authorities, and if not solutions, then at least a conversation to start off with. I am now going to introduce our today's panel, <clears throat> Heritage Preservation and Local Communities, our third talk. The abstract of this talk is very interesting, and I'm so glad that our um, uh, panelists agreed to be part of it. And the abstract is, in an effort to preserve history, some laws are passed and actions are taken that harm that heritage's future. It is easier to place objects into a museum as they easily fall out of use, but it is not possible to do that with architecture and areas. An alternative form of preservation is required to secure the history. That form requires taking into consideration that communities already using that infrastructure. Preserving infrastructure in a way that forces it out of use, stops its history and its tracks, and produces a co-dependent relationship with authorities that do not have a vested interest in sustaining that structure is an ineffective form of preservation. The preservation of heritage should be viewed through the lens of placemaking, where the past helps build new meanings for the future. I now welcome and would like to uh, request my panelists to please introduce themselves and uh, uh, I would like to begin from Nashik Heritage Trail. Hello, uh, thank you so much, first of all, uh, for having me here. Um, anybody who wants to talk about my city, I'm always you know, up for it. Uh, my name is Amrita Ganga Tirkar, and uh, I run a company in Nasik. Nasik is uh, a small town, uh, not so small, uh, but definitely smaller than Bombay or Delhi. Uh, it's a small town uh, in Maharashtra. The name of the state is Maharashtra. And it's been known uh, historically as a pilgrimage. Okay. Uh, recently, Nashik has another, um, you know, uh, feather in its cap, which is, it's a wine capital of India. So it's, it, the, the, the city is, it lives in a dichotomy of this very historic, mythological, religious, you know, uh, pilgrimage. And uh, from the late 90s, it has developed as a wine uh, capital of India. So we get 
lots of tourists and pilgrim pilgrims to Nasik every year. Um, and uh, I started my career as a, a researcher and a documentary filmmaker in Bombay. So I had traveled all across India, the tribal villages, and um, I had documented forts of India, the tribal wisdom, and uh, um, many, many uh, aspects of the culture and history of India. And doing all these things for more than 10 years, I realized that uh, I'm documenting other cities. I'm talking a lot about Jaisalmer and Jaipur and Delhi and all those tribal uh, small, small clusters, handicraft and handloom of, uh, of India, but nobody was talking about my city. And somewhere uh, I thought that somebody should do it, you know? I mean, at that point I was really engrossed with my work and I never thought of coming back to Nasik and doing something here. My only thought was, you know, uh, I'm doing so much for other cities. Somebody uh, should also talk about my own city and my heritage. Um, there is a lot of talk happening within Nasik uh, about heritage and I don't take credit for talking about it at all. But unfortunately, all the talk is happening in Marathi, which is the vernacular language we speak. So I'll say that me and Shilpa and Brunmai are the three, only three people who are trying to communicate with the world outside in the language that the world understands. And this is uh, the thread, I'll say, with which I started uh, my company, uh, the walking tour company which is Nashik Heritage Trails. So in 2016, I shifted back to Nasik uh, with the hope of telling stories of my city to the world. Uh, a lot of people were coming to Nasik and I wanted to introduce them to the city that nobody knows actually. So the people who come for wine tourism, they don't know this part of the city. When I say this part, I mean the old city. Uh, people who come as a pilgrim, um, uh, to visit Nasik as a pilgrimage, they don't know that there is something beyond mythology and religion, okay? So the history part, the historical part, the socio-economic and political history part, they have no clue about. So I try to bridge the gap between the, these two tourists and also the gap uh, where people are only talking about mythology and religion and not talking about why the city exists uh, in the first place. And uh, when you ask me to talk about the local communities, you know, um, I, it's my observation and it's not like 100% true, maybe I haven't met people, uh, but my observation is that most of the people who are talking about heritage are not part of that heritage. They live somewhere far away and then they comment on people who are living in the old parts. And it happens in Nasik a lot, like people who are commenting on heritage, heritage preservation, they don't really live in the old city. So they don't know the problems of old city. They don't know what the people of old cities want, what uh, they aspire to be or what they aspire to have. So my, I'm being uh, from the old city, uh, having a house in the old city also makes me the local community that you want me to talk about. So uh, it, instead of being uh, an outsider, I can also talk about my city from insider's point of view and not only um, uh, criticize people, you know, for not preserving their heritage. So I'm going to talk about the communities and how uh, these communities play a very important role in preservation of heritage in Nasik, uh, positive and negative uh, sides of it. But before that, I would like to talk about the communities itself. You know, who are these people who are here? Why are they in Nasik? You know, why somewhere? Why are they not somewhere else? And Nasik has a very mixed kind of culture, uh, language-wise. Also, you hear many languages when you walk through the lanes of old Nasik. Um, it's part of Maharashtra, but it has cultural influence of Gujarat and Mar uh, uh, and Marwad a lot. People speak different languages. The food is influenced by Gujaratis and Marwadis. And the reason uh, is very interesting. And even the people of Nasik haven't really thought about their city in this way. And this has come out of my research. So before coming to communities, I would like to talk why these communities are here. And for that, I would go back a little um, and talk about the history of Nasik, if that is okay, okay? So historically, Nasik has been known for three reasons. One is it's connect with Ramayana. So I'm sure 
even if you don't know the story of Ram, you know that Ram was an important person in the history of India. And there is a lot of controversy, a lot of talk about uh, Ramayana and the temples and everything. So um, this figure uh, who is revered in all across India, Indonesia, Malaysia, everywhere, all across uh, the world, uh, the story goes like uh, Ram, Lakshman and Sita. Ram, his wife Lakshman, uh, Sita and brother Lakshman, they are in exile and they walk through India and they follow a path and Nashik falls on that path. So Nashik name also comes from uh, nose, Nasikya is nose. So one of the characters nose is chopped off, it falls here. And that is how Nasik gets its name uh, from Nasikya, which is nose. So every nook and corner and bridge and chalk and alley, everything is named after some character uh, from Ramayana. Uh, you cannot escape Ramayana when you are in Nasik. If you know the story, the entire area just comes alive. So Ram, Lakshman and Sita, they spend uh, the tail end of their exile in Nasik. It's a very dramatic story. A lot of drama happened. And uh, if you walk through the lanes of Panchavati, where they actually lived, of course, it's a mythological, historical story. So everything is kind of revolves around the story and the characters. Okay, so that is number one. Number two is Kumbh Mela. So uh, every 12 years, an astrological event occurs. I mean, it all, it depends on the planetary uh, movement, but the, the event actually happens. The calculations are based on Indian calendar. Uh, what you have to do is uh, you have to take a dip at a certain place, at a certain river, very auspicious rivers like Ganga and Godavari. So Nashik is on the banks of Godavari. So there is a specific area where actually around this area, my walking tour happens. So I'm going to um, uh, show you the place exactly where Kumbh Mela happens and the texture and the color and, you know, of course not smells, but um, a lot of beautiful visual elements uh, that happen over there. So Kumbh Mela happens in Nasik, that is number two. And number three is all the rituals uh, that uh, Indians perform after death. So right from uh, the immersion of ashes after cremation to the 10th day, 12th day, 16th day, you know, all the rituals happen at the river. So the, that place where everything happens, we call it a ghat. Ghat means where you where are the steps and you go to the river, you know, uh, you take the steps and go to the river, that entire area is called the Ghat. So um, Nasik is historically known for these three reasons. And I'm going to show you how it looks actually, until and unless you see it yourself, um, you won't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to be talking about material, I'm going to talk about uh, how the heritage is built out there and who built this heritage, uh, the communities. So why these communities uh, came and settled in Nasik? There is a very interesting geographical reason also. And uh, uh, that is the, the location of the city. So can I share my screen? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, so when I talk about the Ghat, this is what I'm talking about. This is the exact place where Kumbh Mela happens. The black stone that you see here is the stone that is used all over Nasik. Most of the construction, the heritage buildings are constructed uh, in this black stone and a lot of wood, which comes from the, the, the forest around Nasik. So um, when I'm talking about heritage, this is what I'm talking about, you know, a lot of basalt rock. So the story of this rock is very also very interesting. Um, when uh, around 68 million years ago, there was a volcanic eruption somewhere in Arabian Sea along Bombay, and the lava formed the Deccan Plateau that uh, we live today on. So uh, this basalt rock is the identity of Nasik, and most of the temples are constructed in this rock. And um, even Buddhist monks uh, came from Bihar and they wanted to spread Buddhism all across India and abroad. They came to Maharashtra and they discovered this rock and um, that is, uh, Maharashtra has the maximum uh, Buddhist uh, caves, Buddhist carvings. And Nashik also has uh, very, very interesting Buddhist carvings made by these 
these uh, Buddhist monks. These Buddhist monks also came here, they settled here for centuries and they worked on these carvings. And um, we have found inscriptions where they mention uh, how the villages, villages were given to these Buddhist monks for their upkeep and how uh, all the dynasties, people who ruled this part of uh, India, they also supported uh, these Buddhist monks so that they can do, they could do the carvings. So I'm just going ahead and um, so I'll just give you a quick idea of how this all happened. So can you see Nasik here? Um, uh, next to Mumbai, below Malegao. So Nasik, uh, historically is known for the religious and mythological reasons, but why it flourished, it has a very different uh, historical reason. And it's because it fell on the trade route. And uh, if you see in the photo here, uh, you see Vindhya range, you see Satpuda range. So once you come from North India, you cross Vindhya and Satpuda, you come to the Southern part of India. And whoever controlled this part, you know, whoever controlled the movement of people and goods, uh, especially the trade became very rich and had a better control uh, of the taxation and everything. So whoever ruled this part of uh, India, they always wanted to control uh, this, this middle belt and Nashik fell in that belt. So whoever, I mean, um, right from second century BC to even today, people are trying to control this trade. And today also, if you see the Bombay Agra road that we take, like which is like the arterial road, uh, trade route in India, it also goes through Nasik. So I'm just going to give you a quick um, uh, chronological order who ruled Nasik and who supported this trade and who flourished in, in Nasik. So right from Satvahans to Abhir and Ahir, uh, the Yadavs, uh, the Mughals, uh, uh, many other dynasties, uh, the British, uh, the Marathas, the British, and the post after independence, we are also using the similar trade routes. So there were many trade routes going through this area. Uh, Khandesh was a very important part uh, when the trade happened, and Nashik was part of Khandesh at that point. Now Nashik is part of Northern Maharashtra, and Khandesh is separate, but the trade played a very important role. Uh, how the story of Nashik actually uh, came around. So when I talk about communities, uh, it's very important to talk about trade because all the communities that have come to Nashik and settled here, they all came here because of the trade. The entire belt of Nashik and Khandesh was inhabited by the trade trader community. Uh, they came from Gujarat and uh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh. Of course, at that point, there were no borders. Now I'm talking about these states, but when they came here, predominantly they settled in this, in this belt um, because uh, Nasik was on the trade route. And when I talk about the old part, I talk about this entire area where uh, the most important aspect of uh, the life here, the heritage here, the lo lo locality is here is the river. And where the river takes a turn, you see here, that is a very important area and where the ghat is and all the religious activities, the all the rituals after death, everything happens in that area. So this is how the, the temples look, you know, this is the stone that is used predominantly everywhere in Nasik. And when the traders arrived here, they also constructed a lot of their villas, their bungalows uh, along this, this entire belt. And uh, they got the karigas, they got the artisans from Gujarat and Rajasthan. And uh, we have amazing architecture, amazing mix of architecture, I'll say. In Nasik, you'll find a khichdi kind of architecture, mix architecture, where a little bit of North Indian architecture is seen, a uh, little bit of Islamic architecture is seen, a little bit of South Indian architecture is seen, a little bit of Persian, uh, you know, uh, faces are seen on temples. So it's like people came from all across India, 
uh, for trade. They settled here. Even the rulers, uh, they traveled all across India. They went to Afghanistan. They went to Banaras. They constructed ghats there. They brought a lot of artisans, a lot of people back to Nasik. So Nasik has a very cosmopolitan feel as far as even architecture is concerned, food is concerned, languages are concerned. So what they did was the traders came and to establish their uh, control, they built uh, a lot of uh, uh, heritage buildings, beautiful villas in Nasik. We call them vadas. You know, very typical uh, architectural um, building in in Nasik is called vada. So they build amazing vadas. So most of the vadas you'll find are built by either the jewelers who came from Gujarat, the traders who came from uh, Gujarat and Rajasthan, and a lot of money lenders because the rulers of this part of the country they uh, borrowed a lot of money, uh, and a lot of money lenders had their own uh, villas. A lot of priest families have their own private temples and villas uh, also, because um, Peshwas, who were the rulers, uh, they supported the priest community a lot. So they also flourished. So whatever architecture you'll find, it has some connect with Ramayana. It has, uh, most of these temples were smaller, at some point, but all these communities who came here, uh, it was the community of uh, the officers of uh, the rulers who donated a lot of money. So this particular temple is Kara Ram temple. Kara is black, Ram is Ram, and this is black Ram's temple. This is nothing to do with black as a race, but because the deity, the idols are in black stone again, uh, it's called Kara. So Kara is black in Marathi. Kala, I mean the same Hindi word. So uh, whatever you see today in Nasik, it is from the 18th century onward. There were many temples uh, that existed before 18th century and uh, the officers, the priests donated money, they commissioned bigger and better temples. So this particular temple was also like a small wooden uh, temple at some point and then uh, people commissioned a bigger one. So the, in the right, you see a small cave temple, actually. So because we live uh, in Sayadri range, we have these small, small caves also, of course, built again in basalt rock. So what people have done is they have created a temple inside a cave and Sita used to sit there and pray. That is the mythological story that people tell. So this is what uh, Nashik uh, looks like actually. Again, the same black rock. This is an, another Shiva temple. And um, this is another beautiful temple. And this has a lot of Persian elements on it, which is very strange to be found in this part of the country. So I don't know if you can see, but there is a man sitting on the top of, on the left. He has a very Persian, uh, Zoroastrian kind of a face, which is found on Parsi Agyaris, which is very strange for a temple found to be Nasik. So this is the ghat where people come. Uh, they, uh, it's a very lively space right from the morning, all the rituals begin. A lot of people come there uh, wishing uh, good for their ancestors. You have to make a wish and you have to, uh, you know, uh, make a wish for your ancestors. And it's a very lively area where all the rituals happen. Uh, the communities I talk about also, uh, are these communities that live along the uh, the river. Uh, so this fellow right here is trying to get the gold out. Uh, when you immerse ashes after cremating the body, you come here and you immerse ashes. And a lot of times these people are wearing gold when they're cre cremated. So... Uh, so... Uh, he is trying to get that gold. So when I talk about community, I'm talking about communities whose livelihood depends on this heritage uh, area. Uh, this is where, this is again the ghat, the temples. So just trying to give you an idea how Nashik looks. So uh, a lot of times people come uh, for the last rites of their loved ones and then they donate some money for construction of some memorial. So this is a memorial constructed by the King of Kapoor Thara, where this is actually a Piao. Piao means water dispenser. There is a small caveat in the 
mouth of the lion there and it is a sink. So Nashik Ghat is loaded with all these memorials. And this is another memorial uh, constructed by another king from a princely state. There are many beautiful uh, heritage buildings. Nashik is also known for the flower market. So if you come here, you'll also find a lot of communities engaging in, in the flower market. Uh, the bridges are also named after Ramayan Ram. And this particular fellow who is Hanuman is not just a statue there. Uh, in Nashik, when the river is flooded, this is like the major of uh, the floods and we don't really uh, say that river is flooded it is known by you know how much water uh, has reached so if the water is still Hanuman's feet it's okay the water rises till his knees then there is chaos when the water comes to the uh, shoulders uh, there is utter chaos and when Hanuman is completely submerged in water there is you know that is really really bad situation so these are the local uh, these are the elements that local communities have come up with and the local communities talk in terms of all these things so there are these beautiful villas i was talking about this is a hand painted mural facade of a of a villa of a vada uh, which is which doesn't exist last month we saw it for the last time so now every time i enter the old area i see uh, one vada after the other collapsing because the community is not really interested in the upkeep of the buildings. So this is another vada which has beautifully carved uh, front facade. Again, uh, people are in very in a, in a very conflicted uh, uh, situation actually, where they do not know what to do with their heritage. They don't really have the money to maintain. The maintenance of heritage in Nasik is once a year you just give oil paint and that's it. So a lot of, this is a very beautiful uh, vada. It's a 300 year old vada. Again, uh, used by the, the rulers as an administrative building. So administration means Sarkar. So it's called Sarkar vada. Again, bad condition, but uh, this is what is remaining right now of our heritage. So uh, I am going to now, this is a very interesting vada and I made it a point to have the building here because this was recently featured in a film which talked about heritage conservation. So the, because I'm talking about communities, I, I would like to mention this particular film. Me and Shilpa watched it together. So she can also tell you about her experience. So in this film, the main protagonist is, he lives on the banks of Kodavari. And he lives in this particular building actually. And he wants to destroy this vada and construct a, a modern new building with parking space, with Western toilet, with 24 hour uh, water supply. He's fed up of living in a heritage structure. He knows that the heritage structure uh, values a lot, but not really in a very tangible way. You know, he wants to buy a car, but he doesn't have parking space. He wants to have a Western toilet. He can't have that. He wants to have like a lift in his building. He can't have that. So these are the problems he is facing in this uh, in this film. And towards the end of the film, you will see what he does. The solution. I mean, they did not daydream at all. They. I mean, I was hoping that like any Bollywood film, they will end it with you know like a goody goody kind of uh, uh, message where he does not go for uh, you know destroying his heritage. He's um, he kinds of, you know, accepts that, you know, no, this is great and I want to preserve it. It doesn't happen towards the end of the film. Uh, they show that the building is going to go and there is going to be a new building uh, at, the, at that place. But um, when I talk about community, this conflict is what I want to talk about. Other community that you see at the heart is a nomad. So all these nomads, they forage uh, forest goodies and they bring them to the ghat and they sell them there. Uh, a lot of uh, different kind of you know nomadic tribes you see all across the ghat with their beautiful jewelry and selling their produce, whatever they make and whatever they for it, forage. Nashik also is known for sanatorium. So the ghats were um, dotted with uh, beautiful sanatoriums where people with chronic illnesses came 
uh, they lived there, you know, it was like a win-win situation for them. If they get better, they get to go home. If they die there, you know, they their uh, soul is, you know, uh, you don't have to come back to the human life again. It's it's free because you die in Nasi. So because it's a holy place. So people used to come here and spend their uh, last years of their life uh, in the sanatorium. So the first picture that you see on the left is a sanatorium. Then there are there were many beautiful lodges in Nastik. And I don't know, uh, I don't think you can read the name because it's written in Devanagari. This lodge is called 15th August Gujarat, Gujarat Lodge. So it is dedicated to the memory of um, uh, independence and uh, such many such lodges exist in Nasik. And the last two images are of the uh, vadas that have been destroyed, beautiful vadas, two to three hundred year old vadas. But unfortunately, the the communities, the um, the families are not able to keep up with them. They don't either don't have money or there is family conflict. Uh, people have different ideas of what they want to do with uh, their heritage, and they are just going away. So Nashik is also known for many cultural heritage very intangible kind of heritage. One is the Nasik dhol that you get to hear a lot when you hear Indian music. And also it is full of uh, the uh, akhadas we call the talims where uh, kushti happens. So you'll also find a lot of uh, akhadas in Nasik and all the communities are involved in all this. So these are the just the pictures of some other buildings which this was a very beautiful vada with four courtyards and it is uh, it was right in front of my house uh, in in old nashik and it's now gone the left one is uh, an art deco building so most of nashik's uh, uh, single screen theaters were art deco uh, uh, buildings now of course they are just taking their last breaths and you will i mean i'll never know when they go away so i'm just trying to document them so this is what nashik looks like a lot of um grill uh like people express them a lot through grills in nasik and this is a very strange and very interesting thing that i have found in nasik that people express their ideology their identity you know uh, their belief system their political ideology through their uh, grills on their uh, on the uh, on the buildings. So this is Shivaji Maharaj who established the Maratha kingdom. This is his face on a grill, and many such grills exist where people uh, have tried to convey their political identity through these. And uh, this is just one such example. This is one temple uh, which is which is re being renovated for the second time. So when you talk about heritage conservation, this is a good example. It was uh, destroyed in the 18th century. It was renovated in 1756. Now we are renovating it again in 2022 and three. Uh, so the, the, the left part, the, the, the bigger, taller shikhar is the new shikhar that is coming up in Nasik. I think Shilpa will be able to talk about it uh, better because the materials they are using, the technique they are using, probably she is a better person to talk about it. So the food is also a very distinct part. This is a family that lives in a 300 year old vada in Nasik. It has 36 rooms and each room has been assigned to a brother or a sister or an uncle. Okay. It's a beautiful vada with the most amazing uh, structure and uh, the woodwork is so beautiful. They are not even able to uh, dig a hole in a wall or put a nail in the uh, in the wood. It is so strong and it can go for, you know, next hundred years. Unfortunately, the local communities are facing a very serious issue. The builders are after their life. Uh, the brothers don't talk to each other. Each of the 36 rooms is locked by the person who, who, who it belongs to, the person has shifted out of the old area. They live in a lavish, beautiful flat in the outskirts uh, of uh, Nasik. They do not want to open these rooms. So there's no maintenance and nobody can, even if they want to maintain these vadas, they can't because uh, the owners want to keep them uh, to themselves. So this is how Nasik uh, looks like.
and I'm going to shut it and stop my uh, screen sharing. Thank you so much, Amrita. This was amazing. Uh, walking us through it was like a virtual walking tour with you. Really, yeah. really appreciate it. So just for the our audience who's just joined in, I'm going to quickly uh, read out <clears throat> Amrita's background. She just talked about Nashik uh, uh, City and her project is called Nashik Heritage Trails. Amrita Ganga Tirkar is a qual uh, quantitative research analysis turned researcher and documentary filmmaker who after working in Mumbai for many years, making non-fiction films and teaching filmmaking at a prestigious design school in Pune, finally settled in her hometown, Nashik, to start a travel experience compelled called Nashik Heritage Trails. You can follow her on Instagram for more information. And through this company, she's trying to tell the untold story of Nashik's unique cultural and built heritage. She hosts walking tour in historic old Nashik and Panchavati area and designs and curates experiences through these um, textile heritage trails. I'm going to now uh, uh, request Studio Urban Dialogue to come on board where Shilpa Dahake and, uh, and her partner will uh, introduce and to take us through their project. So Shilpa is a trained architect and an anthropologist. Her research interest lies at the intersection of urban governance, cultural reconnections and participatory planning. Specifically, she has been working on urban ecologies of small and medium-sized cities of India. In the course of her research, she has been experimenting with ethnography, ethnography specifically multimodal tools of photography, participatory methodologies, and visual narrative building through illustrations. In 2021, Shilpa received PhD in anthropology from Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Mohali. During her doctoral research, she was awarded the Fulbright Nehru Doctoral Fellowship to work at the University of Pennsylvania between 2009 and 20 and Sahapedia UNESCO <clears throat> Fellow in 2017. Her work experience ranges from being an urban researcher, practitioner, and educator. She's currently working as a co-founder of Studio Urban Dialogue in Nashik. Urban Dialogue is a studio that is experimenting with natural building practices to suit changing urban climates, as well as nurturing processes to reconnect with natural heritage in and around Nashik. Following are some of her other profiles, a senior urban fellow at Aboha Urban Studio, a collaboration between Aboha Municipal Corporation, and many other things that she has achieved. And I would like to now leave her to talk about her narrative and also if she would like to build upon her introduction to our audience. Thank you so much for, our for uh, the audience to being part of our third talk. I would request if anybody joins us um, to switch off their mic and their video as we now uh, go for our second panelist, Shilpa. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I really love the idea of Pakistan Short Community Center and how you're trying to bridge gaps with across borders and bring people on board from various, uh, various countries, various uh, backgrounds together. Thank you so much for bringing us also here on this, this platform. Uh, so yeah, me and Rinmay... Uh, both Shilpa, would you talk a little bit louder? Yeah, yeah so me and... Uh, can you... This is better? Yeah, much better. Thanks. Yeah. So me and Rinmay began uh, the studio Urban Dialogue in Nashik a few years back, but uh, it was the COVID times and we couldn't sort of step into proper practice uh, then, but now we are properly into practice in Nashik as an architectural research firm, which is working in Nashik. And um, before, uh, like, like Amrita mentioned about her background, that she is from Nashik, and Rinmay also, who is my partner here, you can see her on a di different screen window uh, under Urban Dialogue name. Uh, she's also from Nashik, but I am not from Nashik, but I fell in love with the city uh, uh, of Nashik when I was working for my PhD doctoral research, and I decided to sort of shift here and make the city my home. Since past seven years, I'm being I'm here. The first half was my research uh, based uh, research based engagement. And since past three years, I am properly settled in Nashik and working for the city with the people here. So uh, that's for me, I just I'll just start sharing my screen and talk about our journey of studio urban dialogue in the city.
So, uh, yeah, is the screen visible? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what I'm, uh, what we be we began uh, when we began urban dialogue uh, as an architectural practice and as something which also engages with research, we specifically thought of uh, choosing the city uh, as our uh, lab from where we learn and gain our knowledge base. So why, like the, I am titling today's our uh, interaction as a conversation between urban heritage people and architectural practices. That's the crux of urban dialogue and how we sort of see our self position in architectural practice of Nashik. So for us, uh, the Nasik, the city itself, the river, which is a major part, major component of city uh, and the people. These three are our key, uh, key, uh, found, key founding stones of urban dialogue on which we, from which we inspire and from which we uh, gather our knowledge to sort of uh, uh, produce and experiment more in architectural practices of Nashik. So uh, urban dialogue, we see it as continuous conversation between people in the city. And as architects, we see it something to, uh, we, we see, we see, uh, we, we see urban dialogue as something which is mediating between people in the city uh, uh, through architecture. Um, uh, so uh, like um, uh, Amrita took you through uh, Nashik very beautifully, uh, it's older parts. I just want to uh, sort of give you a spatial understanding of how the city looks. Uh, the city is along the river Godavari, which is the second largest river uh, of, the, of, of India after Ganga. And uh, unlike Ganga, uh, Godavari is a non-perennial river. So it, it only has, it, it is basically monsoon fed river, which originates from a, a Brahmagiri mountain range very near to Nashik. So the first map you see the, the greener part, which is shaded here is the entire watershed of the Godavari river. And at its mouth is Nashik, very close to its mouth, the, the city Nashik is located. Uh, and when we zoom in into the Nashik's urban fabric, the bigger, bigger map shows you the current existing limits of city boundaries of Nashik. And these browner, dark browner versions that you see uh, areas highlighted here. The dark brown area is the old Nashik where we, from where you saw beautiful visuals from Amrita's presentation, the old Nashik. And as the city grew during the colonial times and then later on, the, the city sort of progressed. And now we have this huge city limit of around 260 square kilometers. Uh, the old Nashik was around 13, 13 square kilometers. So you can see the difference how city has grown over the period. Uh, so um, uh, for like, I'm uh, talking about the Kum Mela, Kum Mela, which happens uh, every 12 years. So uh, this particular event is a very important aspect for cities urban development. Uh, as every 12 years, the city gets a revamping for welcoming the pilgrims uh, from across the country uh, and also uh, abroad uh, in the city. Uh, unlike the Kumela, so Kumela happens at four sites, uh, Varanasi, uh, Allahabad, Ujjain and Nashik. So uh, the, the uh, Ujjain, the Allahabad one and the Varanasi one along the Ganga river, they, they are very huge in scale. Those Kumbhara are very huge in scale and the cities are also very different in scale than uh, Nasik and Ujjain. Uh, Nasik and Ujjain are, are a smaller medium-sized cities compared to uh, Allahabad and Varanasi. So the nature of Kumbhara here is also very different. Uh, so the entire sort of focus here is on urban development during the Kumbhara, like the one which happened in 2015 um, saw a huge uh, push towards development of uh, road networks in the city and uh, developing the entire connectivity for people who are coming uh, coming in during the Kumbhila, but also that can sustain cities expanding future. So uh, like Amrita mentioned about Nashik's dual 
conflict of uh, being a mythological traditional pilgrimage place and also something also some a place which is developing very fast uh, because it is very close to mumbai and also pune two of the metro cities of the state of the maharashtra so kumbh mela be becomes like a very key a key moment every 12 years in the city's history uh, um, then the old fabric uh, you enjoyed the visuals in amta's uh, presentation already and the river itself uh, so the in the map as you saw the river exactly cuts the city of nashik into two equal halves and we are seeing it urbanize at a very faster pace uh, at one point the old nashik was the only urbanized only built form along the river which was uh, around 2 uh, to 3 kilometers but it has expanded so much that it has engulfed around 21 Uh, kilometers of the river within its urban limits so we see things uh, uh, like build, build bridges coming up high rises uh, buildings coming up along the river very much uh, and i will come uh, about the how we are engaging with these issues in our practice also so uh, for us uh, as urban dialogue uh, we picked up two key themes for now to delve into in our practice the first is the dynamism of the river itself because it's such a fluid river uh, since it's a monsoon fed river it swells up a lot during monsoons and it shrinks a lot during the summers so the fluidity is so much that the city has to cope with this fluid nature of the river and then the material fabric the traditional material fabric of old nashik that which that is existing and that we, from which we can learn from and inspire from so these two are our sort of key entry points uh, from where we are sort of bringing our practice into uh, nashik city and also engaging with people through the river and through the material of uh, the city fabric uh, so i will come i will talk about the river first uh and then about the material we will take over about the material so uh, and, uh apart from the built heritage the river itself is the part of natural ecological heritage of the city the rocks uh, that are used to build the build the temples are from the river bed are are uh, are part of the river uh, ecosystem and uh, the entire ecosystem here uh, uh of godavari is very much linked with how the how the city of nashik uh, uh is doing economically and also uh, flourishing uh, flourishing ac across the periods because the the presence of the river the, its ecology enables nashik to grow grapes to grow uh, many kinds of agricultural produces and because of its uh, climatic conditions that are being developed because of this ecological condition the ecological heritage i would call it uh, the the city is also now called as the wine capital of the country where you uh, have variety of grapes being grown here and there are multiple wineries in such a setup uh, in and around city of nashik so um, this was also part of my own phd research but which we as urban dialogue are also taking it forward uh, to also engage it with the city more broadly uh, so uh, na river as a natural eco uh, ecological heritage um, people are, as city was sort of as city sort of developing further and the more focus is on the land value the real estate uh you can see here also you can see a huge wall being built along the river uh, in the backdrop it's a farmhouse uh so uh, the entire architectural architecture uh, um, vocabulary sort of switched its back toward the river as we as we are developing now uh, the earlier uh, fabric the older nashik fabric it, you can see all the varas are facing towards the river uh i'm talking about the movie that we saw together which is also called godavari uh, the tussle of the protagonist there uh, about the vada about his own house old house uh, and of getting it turned into a new building apartment so there the tussle was with the coming of new buildings his parents his uh, grandfather 
was telling that person that when we, if we build a new building here which is of a new architectural vocabulary we we would face our backs towards the river for for which is which is something very um unspiritual uh, for nashik's uh, local communities because river being something very close to their heart they live along the river for them river is something they see every morning the first thing they see every morning when they wake up so uh, the architectural vocabulary turning their backs towards the river is something very very much troubling and that we that we see across the country nashik is not something very specific about it but we see it along ganga along many other uh, major rivers uh, across the country and also in the broader south asian context also so uh, uh, before just before covid uh, uh, two years before covid uh, we began doing river walks uh every month so that we can engage with river seasonally and how it is changing and document its uh nature document its uh, behavior how it changes with every passing day every passing season how it uh changes its moods with every passing season so river walks was something which we arranged to uh create that connection uh make a reconnection with the river of nashik and the people and then involving people into other border activities so that they can also uh, realize their ownership uh, towards the river their responsibility towards the river and that was through river exhibitions so uh, we used to do walks river walks uh, on early sunday mornings every month and we would pick up uh, one single issue uh, on which we would sort of uh brain from ar- 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 around it and we could sort of we would come up with certain kind of pointers which we can either communicate uh to others who were not part of the walk uh, through social media through write ups or we can communicate it to the concerned authorities if there are certain issues that to be dealt with bureaucracy so that was the sort of the entire setup of these walks and uh, we could uh, just before covid we could manage to do at least 20 such walks Uh, and through that we could sort of document those periods which was just before 2019 so 2019 uh, uh, in 2019 the river faced a very mass- massive floods um and before that in 2016 in a very short span the river was pitch dry in summer in the month of may and within two two months the river flooded twice and that was flash floods uh so this uh this imbalance in climatic conditions is also because of the way we are building along the river in the city so um and that's where we are sort of also learning from the heritage uh, built heritage of the city so the uh, ecological heritage is very much linked with the uh, the built heritage and how people have in the past how people have uh, adapted or use different technologies to cope with these flooding flooding seasons or dampness or moisture in the atmosphere or the heat or the cold uh, which will come to the next in the next part and the second uh, part was the river exhibitions so as as when we were walking uh, with the people people were clicking pictures uh, of different things so uh, we put up exhibition on the ghats where the ghat is something i would i would call ghat a true public space uh, of nashik which is accessible and open to everyone and uh, uh, and people who are living here for them it's an, it's a part of their everyday life so these ex- these photographs were seen by people who are working there who are pilgrims who are coming from different parts of the country everyone was was seeing these pictures and they were sort of realizing that the river is not just the ghats it also expands upstream and downstream of the ghat because the ghat is just a 2 kilometers of a stretch in the city but what we are doing along the upstream and downstream is something to be concerned about so uh with this uh, with this background with this understanding of uh urban ecology of nashik and how climate is changing and we are feeling the heat of it nashik being still a smaller uh, smaller medium sized city we are still fe- fe- feeling the heat of it through floods uh through various uh through a different kind of uh, different uh, fluctuating temperatures here just last year we faced a heat wave here which is very very unusual for nashik because nashik is a is in a hilly plains 
and the temperature here is very much moderate but in the past uh, two three years we have been facing heat waves here so these extreme conditions are hitting us and that's where the material aspect of our practice uh, which we are trying to bring in uh, and learn from the urban heritage uh, which is existing here and then bringing that into the contemporary practices and uh, adapting from it i would now uh, hand over to mrinmay to engage with it so again to go back to the last line uh, after my architectural education of 5 years in mumbai and after a post graduation program in ecology and sustainability when i came back i had a different vision and i knew what not to do uh but that was like a bigger uh, challenge that what not to do because uh, after looking at the heritage after coming back to the old nasik for each and everything like uh, the whole childhood went uh, in coming back to the old nasik to take groceries uh, to go around and roam around the river and everything and then staying a little bit far from the heritage the or the known heritage that is there uh, gave us gave me some clues that i knew that what i want to do like if you walk through the old nasik you you walk through the narrow lanes which are con- completely shaded throughout the day uh, and then you have the buildings uh, placed in a way when the winds are not uh, like the, there is continuous wind flow that is happening and all these things started making sense uh, especially after after architecture and then i met shilpa during my whole process of trying to understand the city heritage and what i want to do as practice and then that is how urban dialogue came into picture um so your we are uh, so we chose a palette in of materials that we wanted to work with which um which was a uh, an answer or which was a which in which we were trying to find a solution to deal with climate change like shilpa mentioned and the uh, um, the materials uh, the palette from which the we chose the material was the heritage or the older wadas uh, building of the city where we found a uh, lime we found stone we found bricks we found timber and then we chose to go ahead with lime uh, working uh, 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 we are, we have we have started experimenting with lime and we are uh, in process of experimenting with the other materials also but we took ahead with lime because we found that it is uh, the urban context or the urban uh, or the contemporary architectural practices uh, lime will be more accepted uh, when we talk about the aesthetics of it or the current uh, the the current Uh, where people now know that you know lime is something that is coming up in the market majorly people only talk about it in the aesthetic manners but when we are working with it we try to educate the people we try to uh, do it through the different series of workshops that we are planning or we are working along where we are educating the masses itself we uh, try to train the masons so that we make lime as a uh as a practice uh, which we can follow also in the urban context but because the whole idea was of urban dialogue is where we would want to bring the local traditional methods that are uh used that are that are still standing high uh, after so many years after many floods after many rains uh they are still responding to the heat wave they are still responding to the heavy rainfall they are still responding to the floods that means these materials are the solution towards the climate change which we need to bring in the contemporary practice also so that is the whole effort or that is the whole aim that we have through urban dialogue um i would uh, quickly run through yeah so these are some of the samples that during our walks we try to collect from the uh, the from the older wadas that are there so if you see the picture uh, on top right uh, uh, top yeah so that is one that is a that was a wada which uh, was right there till like two weeks or three weeks uh, uh, until now and then the next time we visited it was gone so like uh, the whole uh, 
about it what shilpa and amrita was speaking but what we found is like we were we, while collecting the samples we try we are now trying to see how old the sample is or what are the different contents that are there in the sample so we can see different compositions of sand we can see a thin layer of uh, the lime paint that is there so we are now trying to uh, study these samples and see how how they are still responding to the um, the changing climates of the city uh, another uh, uh, i i would not say a hurdle but yes a uh, Uh, while introducing uh, uh, it, it it's a challenge basically while introducing a line in the contemporary practices the main challenge is uh, working with the masons because uh, the the modern practices of using the modern materials uh, which are easy in application which are faster and uh, the time needed is also less and not much of an expertise or efforts uh, would go in there but when you are uh, working with natural materials you need to listen to the materials and not you know put your decisions ki you have to dry in this much time or you are you you don't need time to set and etc but uh, working with materials and training the uh, masons to work with it so we can take it ahead in contemporary practices and the people here are convinced uh, it is not that the people here don't know about uh, what these natural materials do because almost uh, until now each and every family in nasik had their wadas in old nasik or some of their families who have come from the old nasik who have stayed in such buildings so they know uh that some some difference is there in the house where where they have they are brought up and the house in which they are staying right now are uh, what we are doing is we are just trying to connect them back to you know the feeling that they had in the lime plastered house and the feeling that they are getting in the contemporary houses so the challenge is to train the masons the challenge is to uh, convince the clients to a work in uh, lime and the and another challenge is to make them understand that it is uh, not something it is not uh, uh, which is raw but it will give you the aesthetics that you want from a contemporary architectural practice yeah uh, also we through urban dialogue uh, we are into hands on workshops we do plan workshops especially when our project is still going on so through it we try to uh, reach out to students we try to reach out to um, young practitioners and uh, anyone and everyone who is interested in working with local materials uh, so we do conduct line workshops we do conduct the plaster workshops or line paint workshop and we are still in process of uh, we are planning more construction technique based workshops also in the uh, coming future yeah uh, so we we feel that we would continue working in this uh, um, with the lime based or the sustainability based approach and in contemporary uh, architectural practice i would now uh, hand over to shilpa we can't hear you shilpa sorry can you hear me now yes so this was from our side that how urban dialogue is uh, is very much rooted in nashik's uh, nashik's urban fabric uh, we are not into conservation conservation as such but we are learning from the heritage and we are trying to bring into mainstream uh, urban architecture and how people can make that uh, Pa make that part of their uh, heritage uh, and in their contemporary uh, lives and the fast fast paced everyday life of, of an urban lifestyle because we see uh, people have been using these uh, materials in a very uh, remote places like in you can see materials like lime being used wood being used in farm houses which are very much away from the main contemporary uh, urban hubs but the main issues that we sort of uh, through our research we understood that the climate change will impact the urban centers the most and that that's where the it's it's a uh, majority of people would be impacted in the urban center so it's for the urban centers to learn from 
the uh, fast technologies and adapt more uh, and at a very faster pace and that's where the material aspect uh, for us is something very big major uh, chunk major part of our practice and like uh, me mentioned apart from lime we are also experimenting with the bricks the kind of bricks that you must have seen in the pictures that amrita showed you are a different sized bricks and which which we also see these these bricks uh different bricks in also part of punjab uh in in indian uh, part of punjab also so these bricks are also very unique uh, uh they are uh, peshwai bricks they are very uh, they are very rectangular in size bigger than the modern bricks and very thin uh so even that that vocabulary that materiality of the brick also changes how things are built how walls are being raised how walls are being uh, placed or at what angle they are being placed so many of these things are depend on the these materials uh, so yeah i would like to hand over to the uh, thank you so uh, much uh, shilpa may i request you to switch on like stop sharing the screen okay thank you so much this was a very very uh, amazing session and i would like to like kind of bring some points together before we go into questions uh, of course the 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 rules here here that we will we'll ask a few questions and then we will open it up to our audience if they have any query please uh, use that um, you know hands uh, wala jo uh, the one uh, you have it here somewhere on on uh, zoom you can either use that or drop a question in the chat uh, we would love to hear from you as we are into this conversation right now but what a great session thank you so much uh, shilpa and mirim uh, marie and uh, abrita it was a really um, a quite an eye opening conversation and the, but the best part about it was that the shared methods in 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 our part of our region as well i mean i could totally feel that i was you know this is these are the same complexities we go through on daily basis uh, in a city like karachi which is expanding horizontally uh, uh is co conflicting and I, and i loved when you said that uh, backs to the river and we are doing something very similar uh, we are showing our backs to the coast and it is uh, a, a, a and a methodology and and spirituality plays such a important role in in our part of our region be it a temple shrine or any kind of uh, sacred geography the the soft grounds and the uh, the the porous grounds plays such a huge role and uh, so the dual complexity between my th the 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 mythical as well as versus development is something that is very important and i am uh, and i and i really enjoyed when uh, mirin mai talked about listen to material and what not to do i mean this is again something like when we are teaching in universities we are constantly uh, telling our students and and our people who are are part of our sessions that it is very important to create your own um, uh, radical standing which is like you know that's a very important question in a practice what not to do and uh and amrita i mean the way you took us through a very cinematographic uh positioning and and narrated a very visual narrative of how uh <clears throat> ghats are a uh, uh, an element of arrival uh, i would now like to like kind of like before we go ahead and hozefa and aksa ask you a question my starting question with you would be that with, with both of you is uh talking about heritage and people it's a very it's a very tough tough part you know where you might be feeling the pain of losing heritage on daily basis but the reality of the people living in those heritage spaces is quite a real uh, uh, like a it's a it's a living experience right so what they are moving or going through at the moment how do you accommodate and how do you think through when you as when you're walking and witnessing this kind of uh, where your heart is into the built environment and yet the people are thinking the other way around and of course uh, developer play a huge role here and the real estate agency plays like a third party role a huge role here amrita how do you think like nashik heritage trails what is your standing and what do you how do you feel about it and my uh, and my question to urban dialogue is uh, with this materiality that you are thinking through uh, <clears throat> 
you're not conserving, you're, you have a very strong stand over there, you're giving these amazing workshops. What do you think, how do you uh, deal with technology and this fast-paced material, which is concrete seeping in, girders and steel coming in? How do you think that mechanism works? Because in the end, people are also thinking about economy. And, and people are thinking that maybe lime plaster is taking way too long to rake and, and, and apply. So, and, and concrete is a ready-made material. So, in, you know, in that way, if you could just expand a little bit more, because that will be very amazing to hear for our audience in this part of our region. Uh, Amrita? Yeah, so I think there are three uh, things, three steps to take, actually. First of all, um, people should know where they are living and what heritage uh, they have, they own. Uh, I posted a photo of a, of a masala shop, okay, spice shop. Uh, it's it's a beautiful art deco building and I posted the photo and I got a call from the owner uh, asking me what is art deco and why is it important uh, so I explained it to him this is an architectural um, design practice that used to be there in the first you know 20 30 years of the century and uh, he had no clue so he now told me that uh, had I known had I, uh, was I aware of this, I could have done something about the building. I would have maintained it better. So I think first step should be awareness. What people have, they should know uh, what they're doing and where they're living. Second, and I'm a firm believer of this, that um, if people gain something out of it, like uh, in terms of money, some monetary gain, then they do think seriously about maintenance and you know continuing living there. So I always talk to people who own these beautiful vadas in old Nashik and their main concern is uh, why, why we should do this, why we should live here. It's so expensive to maintain uh, these structures. We don't have any help. So why should we really uh, think about uh, taking care of this white element, uh, elephant, you know, this is really expensive. So uh, I tell them, you know, why don't you think of having an Airbnb? in your building, you know, starting like a heritage hotel, uh, trying to collaborate with people who want to uh, start a heritage hotel, something like that. But uh, I think opening up your minds uh, for more possibilities uh, is one uh, option. I think that could happen. And third is, especially I'm talking very specifically about Nashik that the uh, people who are custodians of heritage, they don't see local communities as their partners, you know. Actually, they see them as their enemies. And it's very strange that Archaeological Survey of India actually wants to preserve the structures, but they don't think that uh, they sh the local communities should be involved. Or I will go ahead and say that it's actually counterproductive sometimes, their behavior and their actions. For example, uh, there is a temple in Nasik, which is a heritage structure. And so the rule is you cannot uh, do any construction around like 100 meters radius of this temple. You cannot even put a nail in your own house if you come in the, that radius. Now, instead of teaching people and educating people what to do if you want to put a nail, if you want to put something, want to do something in their houses, what these authorities are doing is, um, so there was this, uh, she talked about the floods. And so Nashik had two weeks of continuous rain in July last year. Okay, so it was people were miserable, their business was affected, and there was total chaos in the city. So people who are living outside this particular temple, they put some shade, some shelter uh, for protection from rain. And the next thing they received was a notice from Archaeological Survey of India that you can't do that. But the problem is nobody's telling them then what to do. So the local communities are actually not cooperating to the authorities who are trying to maintain the heritage. So I think first is awareness, second is uh, um, you know, earning from your heritage, you know, your buildings, your ancestral properties, uh, having avenues to do that. And the third and most important is uh, working towards, you know, the local governance, local municipality, the Archaeological Survey of India. Everybody should come together and work towards one goal and not, you know, go in, you know, different directions. So I think these three should be the uh, first. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you so much, Amita. That made really sense. And I keep thinking about this, you know, uh, in, in, in maybe like a, maybe a next webinar could be that one needs to think about policy versus workshop. Maybe policies are something very top down and maybe workshops can make a difference. Um, and, and a participatory methodology is something that we are theoretically taught all the time. But how much is it applied is something that one needs to, you know, kind of uh, expand on. Uh, Shilpa, would you and uh, my, uh, if your partner and you both would like to expand on the query on, on, on the material? Yeah, so uh, uh, I would like to answer the question that you asked Amrita also slightly sure, uh, sure. Uh, about uh, how to how the ambiguity of how people can engage with material of the heritage uh, conservation. So uh, Nashik, uh, just a smaller context note about Nashik is the entire heritage site that the ghats and everything that you saw, they now they fall in floodlines. So there is an ambiguity about how they are to be maintained or what to be done and or not done there. So people are also trying to get rid of that headache of uh, again and again asking and getting notice from the bureaucracy and uh, doing the rounds of the government offices to get permission to do this or that. So that's one thing where I think the policy that, that you rightly mentioned should think about how policy can play a role in, in uh, engaging with heritage differently. Not everything needs to be top down. And workshop me method and participatory should be a practice and not just on papers, definitely. Now coming to the material aspect that you asked uh, us about, uh, coping with the speed of concrete structure building, uh, iron, steel, everything. So what is happening right now in Nashik with the new materials that uh, for apartment, you see these flyage uh, blocks being used to raise the higher structure very quickly. But what has happened is while they are being constructed, you see things of water dampness, leakages very early, very early uh, in, in their construction. And because of Nashik's climate being uh, very wet, very moist, you see rising dampness in each and every flat, each and every building across the city. And this is something which is increasing and which will, which will increase in future because the prediction that is uh, there by uh, the climate change experts that Nashik will become much more wetter uh, in the future. So that's where I think uh, we are trying to uh, pinpoint that you're facing this right now and it will become much worse in future. Uh, so that's where the line sort of getting a bit of ex uh, acceptance, but yes, the speed, uh, the sitting time, everything is something to be, uh, they, they question that. And also then uh, workmanship also, uh, because we, we have fewer masons working with lime, then the cost of workmanship increases, the expertise increases. Um, but uh, uh, we are what we are trying to do is we are not, not trying to uh, replicate the uh, technology that was being earlier used, but trying to experiment it and make it a bit more uh, suitable for today's lifestyle. That's today's pace of construction, you can say. Uh, it's a difficult task because uh, uh, we need uh, uh, help with uh, people who are with uh, who are working with uh, chemical engineering and other other parts of construction bits also. We are trying to slowly build that base as well, but it's a still a, a big, big road ahead for us. Yeah, because then it becomes a, a question of like labor versus artisans, right? And artisans is, is more of a slow pace and, and more creative and art related although in in ideal world we all uh, heritage uh, practitioners would want to create uh, convert the artisans into labor so it becomes as uh, wider as possible so um aksa huzefa would you like to expand on any queries here and we also open it to the public now if you have any questions i know it's a sunday night and we all are uh, trying Can to wrap I just up. add one point? To yes, please. Yeah. Yes, yes, so please. One thing that we have been doing when we started practicing in contemporary context is involving the client in the whole process, like uh, making him a part of the wall that he is uh, painting in lime or plastering in lime. And uh, like where we mentioned about participatory planning, it's not only in research, but participation in getting your house or getting that one wall uh, plastered uh, makes a difference because when the 
client himself uh, uses the materials, feels the whole properties of it, and then experiences it, it becomes easy for him to accept that, yes, it is a material which is going to change uh, its look with time, which, uh, it, which uh, uh, is going to have some cracks, but the cracks are going to heal by itself because the whole property of the material. So basically, we need a little bit knowledge of chemistry also to be sometimes given to the clients where we try to explain the whole process, the properties and involve them in the whole process of how the material is going to react. And that is mostly helping us in convincing the next client that we are uh, trying to uh, pick and the, the clients trying to pick us for the whole job. Amazing. Thank you so much. Aksa? Yeah, I do have a question and um, what it seems from the presentation is that uh, Nashik has a very important ecological heritage. Uh, uh, you guys spoke about the river. I'm just curious to know if there are any communities that do live in and around, you know, these ecological sites of heritage or even uh, other monumental sites of heritage from whom uh, we can actually learn about some very local practices of heritage preservation, apart from the materials that uh, Studio Urban uh, Dialogue has mentioned about like limestone and uh, other materials that you people work with. Are there any practices, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's some sort of farming or, you know, uh, I don't know if there is uh, fishing can happen in those uh, around the around the river. Are there any communities that are sort of keeping the intangible heritage uh, still alive and intact? I would like to add a query to this because it's very similar to what Manur Shah Jahan is asking. Uh, how do we involve local communities when they don't want to be involved or they don't want to see value in heritage the way we do? So one is a practice related query and one is of course the interest. Amrita and Shilpa and Mainumai, you can take it up as you like. Uh, can I go first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She asked about natural heritage. Okay. Yeah. And this question also, uh, if the local communities don't want to get involved, what would you do? So one very simple and age-old solution to this uh, problem that we have come up with, which uh, is tie tied up with religion. Okay. So I'll give you one very interesting example. So banyan tree and uh, a sacred fig tree, these two trees are called keystone species, okay? So they are very ecologically, very important species. And if there is no food and water available uh, in your region, and if you have these two species, you can still survive. So when there is no water and food, all the animals and birds, they flock to these two uh, trees. So banyan tree and sacred fig, have been worshipped uh, for thousands of years in India. And I think the reason is, uh, if I just let people know or tell them the scientific reason why we should preserve these two trees, they will definitely not uh, be interested or they will not see the point, you know. But when I tie this uh, tree to uh, a deity, you know, then uh, these, these trees are preserved for years and years and years. And there are uh, hundreds of years uh, old trees in Nasik. Uh, they are tied to some deity, some local deity, some local god, some temple, and people are preserving uh, these trees. So she also talked about the intangible heritage and there are cultural practices. They are, uh, they, they revolve around uh, these trees. So, um, of course, people have issues now because uh, people think that these are very idiotic practices and why should we follow this? This doesn't make any sense. But I have a feeling that they came around, uh, they were practiced because people wanted to preserve these two trees. And if you go to old Nashik and Panchavati area, you will find lots and lots of banyan trees and uh, sacred fig trees. And right below these trees, you'll find a small temple of a local deity and uh, that is how we are preserving the natural heritage and there are many such examples how the local customs and cultural practices have evolved over the centuries uh, that are preserving certain small small elements of heritage 
and slowly even that is also going away because people don't know the reason they only look at it as a custom and a lot of people don't want to follow them uh, or you know they take the preservation part out of it and they only focus on the religious worship part so they are not really bothered about uh, the what they're trying to preserve but they're only following some very uh, a custom blindly so yeah conflict is there and people don't know the real reason why they are doing certain things but these this is a one uh, example i also give people when they talk about you know how culture religion and mythology can help preserve i i hope i answered this question shilpa yeah thank you shilpa would you like to yeah uh, and myra me if you would like to expand on so uh, part <clears throat> question where people don't want to be involved if you could speak a little louder please yeah, yeah. sorry so uh, the part the question that asks uh, that people don't want to be involved uh, in the heritage or they don't see the value but how how would what would we we can do so i think that's that's where the entire onus falls on architects or practitioners like us to uh, innovate through our practice and uh, come up with various other participatory methodologies which can enable them uh, to see th these things differently and very sadly uh, i want to uh, highlight that nashik has three architectural schools here but th uh, their engagement with the city is very less and that is happening all across the country with what i what i can say from uh, what i can see from here but if um, like just now i think uh, the our uh, college is conducting documentation in old nashik and when when students go there and document these beautiful heritage buildings and people come and ask them what are you doing so these these smaller interventions soft interventions also sort of highlight that oh i didn't look at this particular thing in a different way so not everything has to be at a massive scale but uh, at a very softer scale also we can introduce these uh, smaller uh, interventions which can uh, happen differently this is obviously what we can do with our own purview but definitely these things needs to be something also from top down also in, in a different manner i would wouldn't say from coming from the top very uh, drastically but a different manner how uh, the the bureaucracy the government deals with heritage and the local community and the and to answer uh, about the local practices of conservation so there are practices which conserve uh, with sort of about fishing uh, i would uh, i would like to highlight that there's also a fish market that sets up along the godavari ghats where you get these dried fishes uh, some of them are from uh, in and around nashik which you found in uh, river godavari but very sadly uh, because of uh, commodification of fisheries also uh, the indigenous species are are lost and you just find one exotic species which is sort of predominantly overpowering the other species so even that ecological heritage is getting lost uh, there are techniques to preserve it people are doing it at a very smaller scale by drying it and by uh, using it in their own food uh, cuisines but uh, they are also getting lost because there's no documentation about it thank you um is there any any other questions from the audience you're most welcome to jump in i'm not sure if this was already covered but uh, i was curious how the seasonal nature of the river affects the uh, the heritage and how they view the river as such in their own communities and how they want to interact with it should i answer yeah. that yeah if you would like to just talk about the politics of the water level uh, in in matter of heritage uh, shilpa could you just talk a little louder because of the recording problem we can't hear you properly okay okay uh, so to answer this question about the river and the water levels uh, as i mentioned uh, it's a very uh, fluid river it fluctuates a lot in its volume when it floods and when it shrinks uh, so the the ghat the the old city nashik part where the river is uh, the the ghat is in the religious site is that is at the lowest level of the entire watershed the entire river sort of is at the lowest point there so it floods very frequently and people are used to floods in that region uh, since since uh, many 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 years and they have adapted to those floods um, but uh, 
uh, when the when city began to expand along the river downstream and upstream both especially specifically upstream of that particular ghat stretch old nashik stretch so uh, since it's a, a seasonal river uh, you don't get floods every year so uh, there are things happening like people are dumping uh, uh, construction debris and making land out of river and making coming up with apartment buildings and everything so the river is shrinking in, in the upstream area which is affecting the flood levels in the downstream along the uh, old nashik and uh, that's where the heritage part is and it is getting destroyed very uh, getting washed away very frequently getting um, getting demol getting uh, uh, washed away with every floods you can see a wada or two one or two wada fall because of these floods every season uh, so that's how the water level are affecting the the heritage also but also uh, many of these wada are also adapted to the floods to some extent they can sustain it but when the water levels which they're not adapted to uh, so they're not able to cope with this fluctuating uh, water uh, water levels plus there's a dam upstream so when dam the water is discharged from dam during the floods it floods in a very smaller time and, and at a very huge quantity so the pace of water the volume of water increases very suddenly in the older part so which was not something there in the earlier floods when the dam was not there or when the upstream development was not there so this is also a major issue how flood is affecting the heritage thank you so much for the our response um so i mean are there any other questions from the audience and i would like to ask last uh, question between the two organizations uh, as parting words harish uh, nashik heritage trails and studio urban dialogue i would like you to talk about if you would like to conclude in a format where how how do you see yourself in future with the kind of practice that you're doing um especially with the kind of experiences you both are carrying i mean that's that what's very intrigued us also at pakistan chalk community center when we were developing and curating uh this this webinar uh we would like to hear from you that how do you see yourself uh in this kind of heritage politics where everything is is on a decay and in a, on a violence grounds be it from climate perspective be it from real estate perspective how do your organizations curtail to that and um on that note we would like to then conclude our session hearing from both of you i think uh, i'm collaborating with chilpa and runmay uh while you know about talking about ashik heritage and the river and there are many people who are trying to talk in their own capacities and i think my i see my future or my organization collaborating these with these voices and bringing them all together at one platform and working towards one goal instead of you know every small small like nasik is a small town but we have some small small organizations uh, where people come together try to do something you know they are not all working together so i think my endeavor will be to bring all of them together and have a voice which uh the local authorities can hear and you know work with everybody together there are so many different different voices and different different attempts to uh, preserve the heritage of nasik so i think uh i am going to because i worked in media and i have worked uh, uh i am a storyteller so i think my voice can be used to bring all of them together and tell a coherent story of nashik's heritage i think that will be my goal at least for near future uh yeah for like amrita mentioned that we collaborate very often uh, on when we talk about nashik and broadly the practices here so uh, in urban dialogue also that me and bridmay what we're trying to focus is one is the education part of it which comes from the curriculum development or how people like people who are getting trained into architecture or also allied fields which relate to uh, heritage or uh, urban urban built fabrics all those uh, disciplines how we as practitioners plus educators can bring a different perspective in the way of way we teach these uh, disciplines that's one very important aspect i feel which is very much required uh, uh, 
and the second part is uh, like the that our name itself mentions that it's a dialogue and listen until we have a fruitful conversation and we don't hear every party every uh, stakeholder every person involved in it we won't be able to come to a, a no, i wouldn't say solution but i would say a neutral path of how to how to go ahead so uh, collaboration yes and also trying to um, like i would say uh, our goal would be uh, as we see urban dialogue progressing here in nashik making participation a practice and not just a fancy word that we on and off use and we just throw it around uh, making it more uh, more of a colloquial uh, part of the practice thank you so much this was uh, really amazing to hear that i would like to conclude on the basis of collaboration education and having a participatory method as a way forward and at uh, plus 921 hatch talks also believes in the same kind of methodology uh, 